Today's Wild Sarasota episode is on white-tailed deer. Next. And I am Dr. Katherine Clements. I'm the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator for University of Florida IFAS Extension here in Sarasota County. I provide a variety of programming in the natural resources area, mostly focused on wildlife, uh, native and invasive species, and education about our Florida ecosystems. Another focus of mine is nature meditation and the benefits of being in nature, which harkens back to my previous career as a physician. So I have a bachelor's of science degree in environmental studies many years ago from Buffalo, New York, where I'm originally from. Uh, I have a doctor of naturopathic medicine from Bastyr University in Seattle. I practiced for about 12 to 15-ish years as a physician. And until recently, I lived here in Sarasota County in Oscar Shear State Park with my husband, who was the previous park manager for many years and has recently taken a job with Sarasota County Parks and Recreation and Natural Resources. Uh, so we now have a lot to talk about at home about work at the end of the day. Um, next. In case you are not familiar with UF IFAS Extension, actually UF IFAS was on the local um, Tampa Bay News today. They were at our Tropical Research Center talking about our aqu aquaculture facilities. Um, but Extension offices are in every county in our state and they are associated with our land grant, land grant universities. In Florida, we actually have two land grant universities, University of Florida and FAMU. Um, so every state in our country has a land grant university and extension offices associated with it. Here in Sarasota County, we're a partnership between our county, the University of Florida and the USDA. And our mission really is to take the research and the information that is collected and the data that is analyzed up at the university and then distribute that and communicate that to our local communities, especially focused on community issues that arise in our county. So every county's extension office is a little bit different depending on the particular county and the needs of that county. And you can see we have quite a variety of programs here at Sarasota County. We're a combination of urban and rural and agricultural um, lands here in our county. So we have programs that reflect that, including an ag program, 4-H uh, program, gardening and landscaping with master gardeners who are fabulous, and then quite a large natural resources staff, as well as nutrition and healthy living. Next. Here are just some of the logos of many of the programs we offer you might be familiar with. I always focus in that upper right hand corner um, on Master Gardeners because they're just such a vital volunteer force at um, our office. They provide help to the community both at our office at the plant clinic where they answer questions um, but also out in our community at other locations um, when we get beyond COVID. And then the Florida Master Nationalist Program logo is right next to the Master Gardener Program. And that is a program that is near and dear to my heart. I'm a lead instructor for that program as well as the president of its statewide advisory pro program. And this is just a wonderful uh, program that you can participate in. It is a paid program because it's adult education through the University of Florida, but it's all about our Florida ecosystem Systems, learning about the unique ecosystems, the flora and fauna of them, and then learning how to communicate that to friends, family, and the rest of the community. Uh, we will be offering environmental interpretation, which is a 24-hour Florida Master Naturalist course in October and November. It should be open for registration sometime in the next week or so. Um, if you are interested, I can share more information at the end of the presentation about that program. All right, so without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Adelaide Mahler, who is going to be our speaker today. 
She is our uh, Sarasota County intern or one of them this summer. This is her last week of her internship. We have been so um, grateful to have her with us this summer. I, I couldn't even, it would take forever for me to list all of the amazing things she has done for us this summer. And I really hope that it, her internship has been beneficial to her future as well. So I will turn it over to Adelaide to introduce herself and to continue with the presentation. Yes, and just to say, Sarasota County has been a great place to intern. Um, so if anyone's looking and an aspiring naturalist or have any interest in the environment, I would definitely recommend the program they run at UF IFAS with the county. Um, so yes, I'm Adelaide Mahler. I also go by Addy. I'm an undergrad student at Middlebury College majoring in conservation biology, which is biology and environmental studies joint major. Um, I also have minors in global health and maybe food studies, but that's kind of on the verge because as much as it's of interest to me, that's a lot to pack into my schedule. I'm also a collegiate volleyball player, so go Panthers. Um, my interests fall in food security and environmental justice work, as well as kind of all things ecology, hence my major. Um, and I'm a native Sarasotan, so I'm back home this summer, and I love cooking, gardening, and education. So I'm excited to speak to you all today about white-tailed deer. We're going to start with some deer background and um, a little bit about taxonomy, which I always find super interesting. Um, then we're going to advance into identification and natural history some tracks, scat, skull, and antlers, and I actually have a few samples myself. Um, population status, because there was a significant decline in deer in the state of Florida. A little bit about the importance of deer and the hunting industry, some deer diseases, and then lastly, deer management, because I know deer can be pests to some people, so how to keep them out of your garden beds. Um, so all about deer, and maybe more than you ever knew you wanted to know about deer. So in terms of taxonomy, they're part of the order Artodactyla, which means even toed, and this includes 171 different species worldwide, including like hippos, giraffes, oxen, pigs, then kind of narrowing it down further, they're part of the family Cervidae, which are a true deer, and that's 37 species, including elk, moose, and caribou. Um, and characteristics of this family are that only males have antlers, with the exception of caribou. Um, and those antlers are deciduous, so they'll um, fall off each season. They have specific dental arrangement, reduced second and fifth toes, and you can see that in the vestigial um, dew claws of their hoofs. And they have a four-chambered ruminating stomach, which I find ruminants so fascinating, so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about that later. Um, in terms of species, we have the white-tailed deer here in Florida, and their closest relative is the mule deer, which is out west, although there is some overlap in range. And there are 30 species of white-tailed deer, three of which we find here in Florida. Um, so those three would be the Florida coastal white-tailed deer, which you can see up here in the panhandle. Then we have the Florida white-tailed deer, which makes up the majority of the peninsula. And then lastly, we have the Florida key deer, which usually holds a special place in most people's heart as they are endangered and just a smaller deer. There's only one species of deer or subspecies of deer smaller, and that's located in Panama. So kind of if you think geographically, deer tend to be bigger up north and then moving south um, towards the equator, I guess, north if you're in the southern hemisphere. Um, moving towards the equator, they get smaller and smaller. Um, so we're going to have deer trivia throughout this presentation. Um, so our first question is, what is the meaning of Autocoleus, the scientific name of the deer genus? Well, I hate to break it to you all, but we're not quite up to par on deer trivia just yet. It is hollow tooth, um, so teeth of deer are hollow. Um, so a little bit about the natural history of white-tailed deer. 
In terms of size, a buck or a male deer is about 125 pounds, where a female deer or a doe is 95 pounds. They're about 36 inches or three feet in height. And as I said earlier, they're larger in colder northern states, getting smaller as they move towards the equator. And the Florida key deer is the smallest we can find in the United States at less than 85, uh, 80 pounds and about 27 inches tall. So substantially reduced size and that's an easy way to identify them. For coloration, they have a white throat, a white belly, the right little rump, and then the underside of their tail, hence white-tailed deer is also white. And then their inner ears also have some white coloration as well. Um, and it varies between individuals and with the seasons and kind of geographic location. Um, but for the most part, they are kind of these brownish gray coats. Although there is um, albinism and leucism in white-tailed deer, so we'll get into that. But if you've ever heard of a piebald or a white deer, that's what we're talking about is that reduced melanin. Um, and then in terms of life expectancy, it's four to six years in hunted areas, 10 years unhunted, although there's still quite a few risks to populations, and then up to 20 years in captivity. So as I was saying, albinism and leucism. Albinism is the complete absence of melanin. So they'll have a solid white coat. You can see the top image right here is an albino um, white-tailed deer. I can't find my cursor. Here it is. Um, and they have pink eyes, nose, and hooves. And this is a recessive trait. Um, so both parents need to hold this trait in order for it to be passed on to the individual and the way everything lines up, it has to be perfect um, with those zygotes. But it's a one in 30,000 chance of seeing an albino deer and that's less than 1% of deer. And then leucism, so you have a leucistic or a piebald, that's the adjective form of the word, um, is partial loss of pigmentation. And that's a speckled to entirely white coat, but they won't have those pink eyes, nose, and hooves. And this is also a recessive trait, but far more common within our deer population. So it's around 2% or less than 2% of deer. Um, and this makes them especially especially vulnerable individuals because they're easier to spot as a prey, season, uh, prey species. They don't blend into their background quite as easily. They also might have an arched spine, deformed hooves, a shortened jaw, and short legs, and maybe vision deficiencies, which put them at another disadvantage. Um, so actually back in March, FWC found um, a male, a buck, a piebald buck. And this is a picture right here. He's on the left. Um, and as the caption from their Facebook says, it's an incredibly rare, less than 2% of deer. Um, and they may have those other issues like the Roman nose, the shortened jaw, curved backbone from scoliosis, and maybe deformed legs. Um, so the biologist working at FWC actually took data on this individual to learn more about leucism or piebaldism. Um, and they do take good care of the deer during this time because as you immobilize any creature, you need to watch their ability to thermoregulate or to keep their body temperature right. Um, so they put him on a yoga mat. They also covered his eyes to um, Kind of calm him down and keep them in a good state. So while we're collecting information, we're also taking good care of animals. Um, and then habitat. Deer, I see deer everywhere in Florida and through the Northeast, maybe even more common thinking about New England and the Mid-Atlantic, um, but they can occupy most habitats. So grassland, oak hammock, wetlands, flatwoods, scrub, and they like to be along the edge of forest stands and in open areas. So having maybe a 50-50 split of wooded cover and open area is ideal for a white-tailed deer. Um, they favor early successional stages with brush and saplings. So they want that younger vegetation that's easier for them to eat and digest and extract the proper nutrients from. So food, water, and cover kind of dictate population density because they do have more specific dietary needs than some other ruminants. 
um, and they need cover, but also want some open space to be able to watch out for predators. Um, their home range for females is about one square mile and for males is about 2.5 square miles. So moving on to behavior and diet, um, deers are notoriously crepuscular. However, the ones, the white-tailed deer we find in Florida tend to be out more in the daylight and that is okay. It's not sign for alarm. It just means that they're more adapted to the crepuscular nature of their predators. So Florida panther is the biggest predator of white-tailed deer and they're also crepuscular, which means they're active during dawn and dusk. So the deer have adapted to be out more during the daytime and foraging then, so they're less likely to be predated upon. Um, they have keen sight and smell, especially smell. They're really good at smelling anything and they do a lot to cover the scent of their young, which we'll talk about later. Um, and in terms of sight, we'll also get into that a little bit more when we look at a white-tailed deer skull, but they do have a good sense of sight specifically in the dark. Um, so they're adapted to that crepuscular um, low light conditions. They have minimal vocalization, so there might be a mewing or even bawling noise by the fawns when they're trying to get mama's attention, or bucks may bleat or grunt during rut, but that's not too common. They're pretty silent. Um, they have intense courtship and mating and tail signaling, so when um, a predator is spotted, their tail will stick straight up, and that's to alert every um, all the other deer in the area whoa, something's up, kind of deer in the headlight, they'll all freeze and look and then disperse from there. And then their diet, like I was saying, is leaves and tender tips of woody shrubs, so early successional stages of forest growth. They like greens, grasses, acorns, mushrooms, etc. kind of any vegetation less than five feet above ground. Um, and they're such kind of voracious eaters that they're able to uh, change the abundance of a plant um, eating up to four pounds of food a day. But as we think about deer management and deer populations, we want to make sure that there's this ecological balance in how many deer are present, both for the health of their populations, but also the health of our ecosystems and our plants and the other species they support. And they process their food in a four-chambered ruminant stomach, which takes 24 to 36 hours to digest, depending on the contents. So deer digestion. Um, deers are ruminants. They have an eat now, chew later strategy. So they eat a whole bunch of food that's stored in the rumen, which kind of acts as a sac, and then it regurgitates back up the esophagus and kind of they're chewing the cud, re-chewing the food that they already stored. And then that processes throughout the rest of the four chambers of their stomach. Um, compared to other ruminants, they have less storage. So they have to eat more frequently than other like domestic livestock or elk or moose um, and more selectively. So they have to really make sure they're getting the right nutrients. And they're even thought to avoid secondary compounds. They eat less amounts of food from each plant to kind of make sure none of the nutrients they're getting will have any sort of synergistic impacts or be able to affect if there's... Um, too much cellulose or too much hard material to break down. Um, they digest and get nutrients from foods not available to the simple stomach animals because they have these microbes in their reticulum. Um, these microbes can produce protein from just the available amino acids. So rather than having to make sure they're getting the right quality protein, as long as they're consuming sufficient amounts, these microbes, these bacteria and protozoa can refurnish the proteins and the amino acids and make sure they have the right amount of nitrogen to be healthy and strong. Um, and their digestion is dynamic. So it can change throughout the year in terms of the amount of saliva produced, the lining of the rumen and the rumen size. So if there's a lot of vegetation, it'll gr grow and the reticulum and those microbes and that microbiome will change and kind of readjust within a two to three week period. So it does take a little bit of time. It can't be an overnight, but um, their digestive system is in flux based on the nutrients and vegetation available. So like I said, there's this first lap food 
comes in, it circles through the room in the first chamber of their four chambered stomach. Then we add the microbes, the food will cycle through again and make it into the reticulum. And that's where it's kind of fermented and all these processes are happening to make sure they have the right proteins um, and other nutrients with the help of these microbiome. And then it passes into the omasum and abomasum. Um, so the omasum kind of extracts the water and then the abomasum functions as our simple single stomach. So that's where a lot of the stomach acids come in and make really a homogenous clean layer to go through the intestines and to extract all the normal nutrients that you need. And that happens in the intestinal phases of digestion. So another piece of white-tailed trivia, how long do we think a deer's intestines are? So they have this four-chambered stomach, really complex digestion. They're chewing their cud. They can even starve while full because if they don't have the right nutrients and they're not breaking down that cellulose or super lignified and woody materials, um, it might get stuck up in there. But how long do we think their intestines are post stomach? We have some answers. B, um, 65 feet long. I'm going to give one or two more seconds for others to chime in. All right, Ooh, it's not letting me advance. There we go, it is 65 feet long and that's about twice the length of our intestines as adult humans. So pretty complex, a lot to store within a deer's abdomen. Um, in terms of other nutritional needs, they do have mineral needs. And I always learned from my grandpa about like salt licks and deer licking rocks and other things like that. So they do have the ability to bank minerals within their skeleton to be diverted for later use. So they're constantly kind of trying to absorb these minerals, um, but they can have a reservoir within their skeleton. And this is important for antler growth for males and then gestation and lactation for females. So for antler growth, growing antlers um, are about 80% protein and then calcium and phosphorus then make up to 30 to 35% of mature antler by weight. So like a good amount of their antlers are these minerals, um, but there's up to 11 different minerals needed for antlers, including magnesium and sodium. Um, and salt, like salt just refers to any sort of cation, anion, salt. So the precipitation of these different minerals. Um, Gestation and lactation, like I said, also require high stores of calcium and magnesium, and this can be supplemented in farmed deer through feed, blocks, granular um, additions, or injections. Reproduction. So how do they reproduce? We see a lot of deer, but um, there's actually some particulars that go into courtship and breeding. So males reach sexual maturity at 1.5 years old and females first reproduce in their second year. Um, and the season is called rut. And it's divided into pre-rut, which is sparring matches, and then rut, which is like the actual um, mating itself. So these pre-rut sparring matches are mildly aggressive pushing contests between bucks to establish a hierarchy of breeding. And they can get intense if there's no clear winner from the beginning. And I think there's like less than 3% chance, but their antlers could get locked in a way that they'll both end up perishing from fatigue because they can't unlock their antlers. So I've heard some tall tales about that going down. Um, and then four to six weeks later, there'll be the actual chasing and pursuing of does. So rut is less synchronized within the state of Florida and the time varies kind of from um, summer all the way into the next spring. So you think of the year as starting in the summer and then late would be March, even though that's early in the calendar year, but from the onset of rut. Um, and I have this map to illustrate a little bit. So the Southern part of the state is the earliest, so July to August. 
and then moving north, it advances later and later. And this blue spots kind of, um, I would call it enigma. I haven't heard an explanation for it, but kind of really late breeding. And then across the panhandle in the northern part of the state, it's earliest in the east and then moves later, progressively later as you advance west across the state. So essentially there's a lot of different times that um, breeding could occur and females should their pregnancy not be productive, can wait, I believe a period of 28 days and then try again. So there is a high average of like one fawn per year um, in the state of Florida. And I think that's on this slide. So pregnancy and development, there's a 200 day gestation, which is about 6.5 months. The birth of fawns correlates to peak vegetation availability. There's an average of one fawn per year in Florida. There's a 90% pregnancy rate. Um, so that means that of the attempted pregnancies, the ones that are successful, like if two animals are to breed, the result that ends in a true pregnancy is about 90% of occurrence. Um, I did not explain that right the first time, but lower um, than the northern states. So up north, I think pregnancy rates even as high as 97% because of the more nutritious soils. As we were saying, you need a lot of those minerals for gestation and lactation. Um, they nurse two to three times for the few, first few days and then fawns or baby deer are weaned by four months and then they're chased off before the next birth. So before they're even yearlings, they go away. Males will disperse, females will return and establish a home range of about one square mile in the area. And females will frequently leave fawns alone while they're off feeding. Um, and this is not cause for alarm. So if you ever see a fawn by itself, please don't bother it. They have specific means of making sure there's no smell of camouflage, that spotting on a fawn's coat um, that fades after three to four months. All of that is to protect the fawn and make sure it's okay. And mom is gonna return to it. So if you do see a fawn alone, you don't need to call FWC right away, maybe wait 24 hours and then if mom hasn't come back, that might be um, cause to contact someone. And then in terms of scent, a gland is located between the hoof clefts and the fawns that secretes a scented tracking substance so that mama can find their fawn. Um, sorry, there's a lawnmower going by. Um, can find their fawn. Um, so lots of cool adaptive features to make sure that mom and fawn are okay. Tracks, so we can't smell them, but we can find them if a deer was to stumble through our yard. They have two pointed toes that kind of make a heart shape. They're one to four inches tall um, by 0.75 to 2.5 inches wide. And like I was saying, these dew claws on the back are vestigial toe structures. So remnants of when they actually had more toes, but now they're kind of receded. Um, tracks always point in the direction of travel and the front end of the track tends to sink a bit deeper into the sediment and the hooves are actually toenails of the third and fourth toes of each foot. So um, I'm going to have you all guess is, uh, there's no great way to put this in the chat, but is the deer traveling in this direction going down the page or is it traveling in this direction up the page? So I'm going to give you all experts a second to guess. If you guessed up the page you were correct. So this is the front of the track and then the dew claws are in the back of the track. So those dew claws will always be in the back and that's how you can tell directionality. Um, there's also some confusion between potential deer track and feral hog tracks and feral hogs tend to be wider and rounder, although they will still have the same hoof-like um, imprint. So they're both kind of considered heart shape, but deer are a little bit um, more refined, skinnier and not so round or wide. Scat, um, their scat looks like this on the right. It's this pellet-like 
ovalish, kind of looks like black beans, almost dark brown to black in color. Um, some people call it raisinets. So they have this oily sheen and um, deer will poop 10 to 15 times a day or up to 20 to 30 times during the spring and summer when there's more vegetation available and when they're eating less woody, less cellulose rich stuff that can really flow through that digestive system with ease. Um, and another cool little factoid is that fawns only defecate when and where does instruct them. So another way to keep the scent is for mama to be in charge of where the baby can go to the bathroom so that they're not leaving their scent and being tracked. And then fawns, uh, excuse me, deer does will sometimes eat um, the fawn's excrement as well as a way of cleaning up scent. Um, some people say deer scat looks like the scat of bunnies, but kind of the main difference is the color. I would think deer scat tends to be darker and more oily, more ovally almost, and doesn't dry out and turn the brownish kind of um, crumbly circular shape and texture of rabbit scat. Um, so you can kind of play around with that in your backyard because you might be able to find both. So Skull, I'm going to stop sharing my screen to be able to share with you this Skull. Um, so I'm just rearranging things. And here we have a white-tailed deer skull, courtesy of Dr. Catherine Clements. Um, so first I'm gonna talk a little bit about the eyes. You can see the eyes are on the side of the head and that's characteristic of most prey species so that they have increased peripheral vision so that they can see a potential predator coming. Um, they also have horizontal pupils, again, for that peripheral vision. And in terms of deer eyes, they have a higher density of rods than cones. And because they have more rods, they're more light sensitive and cones are more for detecting colors. So they can't see as clearly as we can, but they can see in more gradients of colors and can see better at night and in low light conditions than we can. Um, the next cool thing is I'm going to pick up the jaw now and talk teeth. So the jaw fits into the skull as so. Um, and there's actually incisors that have not, um, like they've fallen out here, but incisors come only from the lower jaw. And then they have three premolars and three um, regular molars. So the Real molars kind of have two points for teeth and the premolars are kind of one. So this is an adult over than over two years in age um, because teeth are often used to determine the age of a deer. Um, it's the best way to do so. You look at the brown, which is the dentin, or maybe this is a better angle, brown, which is the dentin and the white, which is the enamel and the wear and tear on that. Um, as well as how many teeth. So it's a fawn, they'll only have three to four erupted teeth, a yearling will only have six erupted teeth, and then from then you're looking at the difference between dentin and enamel. Um, but these molars are for chewing their cuds, so the ruminant stomachs, they're ripping with their incisor. They only have a palate on the top, so no upper incisor. They're ripping and that'll look different than a rabbit which will snip. So there'll be more of tears in the vegetation they eat. And then they're chewing their cud with these molars. Um, and kind of the last piece to note about the skull is how long, this is fractured off, but how long their noses indicates how good they are at smelling. So they really do have a keen sense of smell. Um, and then the other thing we're going to talk about is antlers. So antlers are deciduous. Here we have four points on the antlers for eight in total. It will be covered in velvet, which is the vascular tissue that helps it grow so quickly. So you have to grow this whole structure every year and then you lose it. Um, but they have 
velvet covered antlers and then they'll rub it off. So antlers are not true horns. Like I said, they're deciduous. They come off each year and they're outgrowths from the frontal skull bones and the pedicles and they're shed and regrown annually. And, um, and they'll grow to a point like by four years old, they should have eight points on the antler. So four on each side. Um, but a button buck or less than a yearling old male deer will only have one inch of little growth and then they'll have spikes as yearlings and it progresses from there. But once again, dental structures is how you're really going to age most deer. Um, and the size of the antlers is indicator of strength and kind of genetic and nutritional health. Um, and asymmetry is pretty common. It's a reflection of environmental stress like sickness, injury, nutrition, or even the pedicle themselves, the growths damage there. Um, so there are a lot of reasons that they could look a little wonky. Another is velvet antlers. So while this velvet is essential in part of um, any sort of growth of antlers, um, it can remain on the structures and be caused by hormone deficiencies. And then the continual growth leads to these large tumor-like growths. Um, and these are called cactus bucks. So if they don't properly shed them and then continually have this velvety growth, there can be some crazy wonky structures on bucks leading to the name cactus buck. Um, so antler growth is the fastest type of mammalian tissue growth. How much can an antler grow in a day? If you guessed a quarter inch in a day, you would be correct. So this is incredibly fast growth. Think about you have to make a whole antler in less than a year because you have to make it and then shed it and you don't have it for part of the year. Um, so it's really incredible, really protein intensive and like we're saying, um, nutrient intensive. So they need minerals and proteins to build those solid structures. Like we don't grow <laughs> a quarter inch a day. We're lucky to grow maybe an inch a year, like kind of grow spurt more than that, but um, pretty impressive feat. So population history, um, there was severe overhunting in the mid 1700s caused by unregulated trade and deer hides and subsistence farming. So this caused huge declines in white-tailed deer populations. Fortunately, there was a territorial law passed in 1828 that prohibited firearm, firearm hunting west of the Suwannee River. But then come 30s and 40s, there was a new problem that came in, which was the cattle fever tick. Um, so there was this whole deer removal campaign, lots of people hunting deer, hunting excessively um, and not in a sustainable manner. So that was their intent, but the population dropped to 20,000 until 1941 with the enactment of the Pittman-Robertson Act, which was a federal tax on firearms ammunition that funded wildlife conservation, hunter education, and shooting programs. So they took all this money to kind of reframe what a deer is, the harm of deer and the necessity of deer because we do rely on them for certain ecosystem services and benefits. So we want to be able to live in harmony with these populations and benefit from them for years to come. So there were increased arrests for game violations starting in the 40s with the Pittman-Robertson Act. Um, the eradication of screwworm was also incredibly important and rebuilding these populations because the screwworm caused a lot of deer deaths. Um, and then at the time, the Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission, which is now FWC, purchased deer from various sources and implemented a no doe hunting policy and also started managing some lands to build up these populations again. Um, so these wildlife management areas were first established in 1941 with 60,000 acres in Charlotte County, and today there's over 60 million acres of these managed areas by FWC for hunting purposes because the white-tailed deer are Florida's most important game species. Um, the population can't really be estimated today, 
but it sustains a harvest of about 97,000 deer per year in Florida alone. And that creates 14,672 jobs and $95 million in state and local taxes in 2011. Um, so important to economics and our benefit as a human race. Um, so deer are also a unique species whose overabundance can devastate their habitat and they can cause damage to agricultural crops, ornamental plantings, etc. And too big a population can facilitate disease outbreaks, etc. and problems within like intraspecies diseases. So it's really important that we manage these populations, but manage them in a sustainable way. So like I said before, we can continue to benefit from the economics and all the products associated like venison with deer. Um, so kind of talking about diseases, screwworm was mentioned, there are over 120 different parasites, infections, and diseases in Florida deer. An average deer may host um, a number of different agents at any time, but they're unlikely to have an effect although different agents may have synergistic effects. So having multiple at the same time could build on the problem as could other factors like stress or malnutrition that weaken kind of their immune response and leave them more susceptible to, to disease. And some of these diseases do pose um, threats to public health and livestock populations. But um, it's important to know that for the most part, you will be safe. There's low incidence. And as long as you're staying away from the placenta and newly birthed animals and pregnant deer, and then avoiding contact with fresh urine, the rate of transmission of any of the diseases is likely low. So as I was talking about screwworm, I find, um, kind of epidemiology and disease very fascinating. So bear with me as I plow through this, but screwworm is endemic to the Western hemisphere, but now has made its way into the Americas um, and management began in the forties and it was eradicated actually in the sixties in Florida and in US in 1983, but made a resurgence um, in Big Pine Key in 2016. So what happens is an adult female fly deposits its eggs on an open wound and the eggs hatch and the larva actually will feed on that wound. Um, so it means the wounds don't heal properly or drain right and that can cause some devastating effects on deer and dramatic decreases in population. Um, so that 2016 outbreak actually impacted the Florida key deer, which is an endangered species of white-tailed deer that I talked about a little bit at the beginning. Um, and their population dropped about 10% with this outbreak on Big Pine, um, but they have rebounded. So a little bit more on Florida key deer, their high saltwater tolerance, they have low birth rates and more solitary nature than other deer. Um, there was a complete hunting ban established in 1939. Numbers dwindled to only 25 in 1955. And then the National Key Deer Refuge was established in 1967. So there have been a lot of efforts to try to um, preserve and conserve this species, this small species in Florida. Um, so the current population is about 700 to 800 individuals. And fortunately, after the 2016 screwworm outbreak, um, it wasn't too detrimental because mainly bucks were lost. So there was enough of a breeding population to kind of rebound from there. But habitat loss and sea level rise continue to pose major threats to the population. So another disease is lumpy jaw, which is kind of a graphic picture over on the right, but it's a swelling of the lower jaw. Um, there's problems with weight loss, eating, salivation, kind of nasty. Um, and yeah, it's brought on by a couple different bacteria species, but it affects lesions in the jawbone and can result in death, but 
can be caught and treated with antibiotics. So this is actually a common problem, uh, common problem in deer farms and it communicates or transmission is high in those more condensed settings where there's a lot of deer interacting with one another, but not as big a problem in the wild. And then lastly, the most important and like biggest name disease right now for deer is chronic wasting disease or CWD. It's a fatal progressive neurological debilitating disease in the same family as mad cow disease. So it's called the transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, TSEs. Um, and it can remain infectious in the environment for years. So there is a big problem within the deer population of this being transmitted, but there's no evidence of transmission to livestock or humans. So we're not at risk. That said, Florida has not established a chronic wasting disease population or had many um, cases. So it's important to keep an eye out and report any unusual behavior. So signs would include um, excessive salivation, grinding of the teeth, like increased drinking and urination, weird problems with weight loss or muscle atrophy, poor coat. So any kind of ill or weird acting deer, it might be a good idea to report this to FWC. Um, also walking in circles or staggering is pretty common of a deer with chronic wasting disease. So as I said, contact FWC. They have a chronic wasting disease hotline at 866-293-9282. We'll be sending out resources as well for you all to reference after this webinar um, so we can get that information for you. Or if you just Google FWC or CWD, you can probably get this information um, on your phone if you encounter a deer and be able to report it that way. So other population threats, I have hunting. Again, there's about 97,000 deer that are hunted per year. This is generally healthy, so it's weird to put it under the umbrella of threat because yes, it is decreasing populations, but it's in a healthy manner. Cars are the second um, leading factor of white-tailed deer death. Then land access, so habitat loss, urbanization, sea level rise in particular for the Florida key deer like land access and habitat is more crucial for them than the other two subspecies of white-tailed deer here in Florida, as well as adequate vegetation. So that can kind of change their range, but likely not the population at large. And then other threats are predators, coyotes, bobcats, and the Florida panther. So we do want to make sure we're leaving enough deer for our Florida panther, as well as coyotes and bobcats, um, but maybe more importantly, Florida panther, because we want to keep that species alive and well. Um, so whitetail trivia, car collisions are the second largest cause of death for deer. How many US incidents were reported in 2011? It's pretty high at 1.3 million in 2011, and that's in the U.S., not in the state of Florida. I couldn't find quite those same details within our state, but pretty common and pretty catastrophic. So our last little bit will be on deterring deer, and maybe that's what a lot of you signed on for, is learning how to keep deer out of your gardens, out of your beds, so you can install a fence. Um, and keep landscaping close to the house. So the further a deer has to travel to access its food, the less likely it's going to venture there. So um, moving out of their habitat, out of those forest edges, um, it's harder for them and they'll become less and less safe. Um, kind of in that respect, noise and motion are really helpful. So anything to kind of startle or alarm them, scare them off. So noise can be wind chimes, dogs, other pets. Some people use firecrackers. Um, foil or mylar tape can move. Your sprinkler system, you can put pinwheels in or flags. So any sort of 
combination of noise and motion or singularly noise or motion is great. The other thing you can do is learn their taste. So just like us, different deer are attracted to different flavors and textures. Um, so if you plant something they don't like or keep planting something they really do like, then they'll frequent or not frequent that area. So try to play around a little bit if you're not having luck. Um, and it's also influenced by food availability. So while you might not have control over this, you could plant another option that you're willing to sacrifice to the deer in order to save some of your more, more prized vegetation for yourself and for landscaping purposes. There's also deer repellents. So contact repellents are applied directly to a plant versus area repellents are um, applied around plants. And again, we'll be distributing resources, but here is a list of um, different options researched by the University of Florida as some deer repellents. So there will be a link to learn more about all sorts of deer management. And I've heard of people using human hair, bars of soap, tankage, other tricks like cayenne and stuff to kind of deter deer. So try whatever you want and let us know if you're having great success. And again, here are the resources, which we'll put in the chat, but for now I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine Clements. Um, and I just wanna say thank you all for listening to me. It's been a pleasure to talk and hopefully I didn't talk your ear off. All right, thank you so much, Adelaide. That was really fabulous. Lots of amazing information.